I don't know, is this is the dream happening now? I mean, does it feel real? I mean, how exciting is this? Well, it's felt real, honestly, for a while now. And, and my focus has gone from being here and trying to get my verbiage and systems in place for the players to now we have to go play competitive, clean baseball. And JMU Sound, they do a little bit of everything. They'll, they'll throw a lot at you. So it's a test, and it's a test of what we've done leading up to the game and then how well the guys acclimate to the competitive setting that we will clearly be in. Um, so it's real. And now the ultimate reality is, is how well we perform, and, and I've pivoted to that. And you know, the last few weeks have been intense, and, and hopefully we, we go play good, clean, sound baseball. I think then offensively, if we take care of our stuff on the mound and defensively, I think offensively we have a, a capability to be creative and find ways to score. So that's that's where I am right now. Coach, just the emotions of it. I mean, a lot of hype, a lot of build up to, to get to this point. I mean, we're 24 hours out now from opening day. Just the emotions going through your head right now. A little bit of everything. Now, coaching in this stadium, you know, in front of these in front of these fans. I think these are the most knowledgeable fans. They've seen a lot of incredible baseball. The history of the program the emotion really turns directly to how we perform and trying to play a really good first inning. I, I want to get on the field and I want the guys to play a clean, sharp, crisp first inning and get in the dugout and start grinding away to figure out ways to score. And I think if we approach it in those smaller segments, like you're pretty happy with the way things play out at the end of the day. But it is that initial, let's get on the field and get into this and feel the rhythm of an actual game. and. Um, hopefully we play really sound, hard, clean type seminal baseball and we'll try to figure it out offensively, but it starts out on the field and when you're at home, that's essentially the first place you'll find the team. Why is Carson the guy you decided to get the ball to first? Man, he's been, he's been really good um, all preseason and there's a lot of guys that could have gotten the ball first. Um, somebody's got to go out there and try to get us into it. Uh, the selection of the three guys to open these games, I thought, also gave us the byproduct of having some dynamic guys that are waiting in the wings. And we're going to use everybody. There are no pitch counts that are built to the point of feeling like somebody's going to go throw you seven, eight, nine innings. I, I don't see that happening um, just out of pure pitch count and also out of safety for the guys. You know, you get them to 70, 75 pitches in their sessions before this, it's a little bit more intense when you're out here in a game. So when you have Carson going, you, you clearly have Wyatt ready to go, who we built up just like a starter in Carson and um, Whitaker, Connor Whitaker also, we built him up. So we have guys that have some leverage experience to help us this first weekend if something doesn't go as we planned with one of the guys that's opening, starting the games. We know we have some experience ready to go that's what we felt was best to get us into this first weekend of the season. Aside from the, the practice time, just all the other things you, you guys have spent time on since you got hired, between the building and just every, all, the, all the things you guys have worked on, the bullpens and everything else. Yeah. Have you guys gotten all, to all those things when you first came in here and said, these are the things I want to get to, or, or are there still things that you just didn't have time to get to? We made a pretty good dent in the, in the checklist, to be honest. It's amazing what we were able to do. And I, I look at it as, two separate projects. There were probably four or five things going on, but I really tried to reflect on what it was like from a fan's perspective, game day, to have an opportunity, even if it's just one ball game. Some people aren't gonna come every day. There'll be people that sit up there that are at essentially every pitch. But if you're here one day, when you come in that concourse, like the history of the program, that you can see that in a day, that it's clean and fresh and updated feel like we checked that. You walk in that home plate gate now with the, the seminal head and some of the things that are there, and Michael had a big hand in that. That was a, that was a project in and of itself. The new backstop netting, I, I don't know if everybody has noticed that, but you can't have a better sight line. The group that did it, the netting pros, they did the dugouts and that, and they made some modifications in how that thing hangs, so you'll never look through the angled part of that backstop. Those are, those are fan experiences that make for a better game day for them. And then you come out here and the things we've done on the field with the turf, the batter's boxes are down. You guys watch them bunt 200 balls easily before we ever thought about warming up. Um, the baselines are down. 
There's no maintenance at all in this space. We do our infield drills and do some things on the aprons. The bullpen's phenomenal. You know, uh, the locker room graphics and things we did inside that you probably haven't seen. We furnished the tradition room just so we have a meeting space. So there's for the fans and then there's for the players. We got some stuff done in the batting cage. That's probably something that we need to continue to push to, to improve the, the batting cages. But I think we made some good strides in, in really a short period of time for what we got done. Do you remember about the last time you wore that uniform on this field? Well, I remember coaching the number one team in the country, and I remember our shortstop was injured in game one of the Super Regional and couldn't play anymore. Steven, phenomenal talent, and Texas beat us Houston Street. I remember him warming up right over here from third base to the catcher on the warning track, which they eventually changed that rule because of – position player? He was, yes, yeah. he was. And it turned out to be a major league reliever for a long time. I remember that game. Uh, I think that was Augie Garrido was was coaching and they beat us. I remember the intensity of that game and that's the last recollection I really have. It was it was tough because you watched a team that really was very capable all year and we had some weird things happen in the in the super regional and, and didn't get to Omaha. But I do remember that and I remember Texas was good and we had some fantastic players and Tony Ritchie and Chris Hart and Lynch and Peterson and the guys on the mound, Jared Brown at first base. Um, just I remember a lot of those guys. And I do remember, it's funny, Houston Street standing over here throwing 97 miles an hour to the gate uh, from third base was pretty unique. It was ridiculous y'all had to play them in the Super Regional. Anyway. That was a dumb matchup. They're like the number nine team in the country. You all know, were number one. Yeah, I've been through some tough Super Regional <laughs> matchups. You know what that's about. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Coach, apologies that this has been asked of you this week, but I uh, just wanted to know, do uh, you have any thoughts on closer this weekend? You know, we really don't have a by design closer. We, we have these guys that we feel like are really capable in leverage situations and how it gets to that. Sometimes it might be one of those. It could be Wyatt, could be Whitaker. You know, it, it could be David Barrett or Oxford or Ben Barrett or Kirkland or somebody that you simply feel like gives you your last shot after you've shot some of your other bullets and we are not setting somebody aside right now like i think with the pitch counts the way they are you have to be cautious of that because you want to make sure above all else you get to a game that's saveable or closable late and and sometimes especially this time of year i i don't feel comfortable necessarily holding somebody to try to get the last three outs of the game i want to make sure we we get the ball to guys in, in situations that they can extend if needed, escape, and if it turns out to be one of those guys throws the ninth inning and gets us three out, so be it. If not, we have enough confidence in the other guys to go out there and, and seal this thing and get those three outs. How difficult was it for you to play Swyatt? Obviously, you built him up, and there's no set position, as you said, but he had so much experience last year in that long, re long yeah. relief role, and that's where he seems to be to start the season again. Uh, just how, how did you come to that decision? Was it the experience that he had there, or did he kind of just fall into that place naturally? Well, I think it's a combination of that. Like, you, you feel with somebody that dynamic and that experience in that role to start the season, especially when your pitchers that are starting the games haven't been in that before, I think it gives you some stability to get through an opening type weekend. He's clearly going to pitch, and he's capable of pitching a good amount. We just thought that was the most logical way to go about it and was best for the, for the team as a whole to get out of the gates. And we just decided to build him up. You don't know how the preseason's going to go, so we felt like we had five or six guys that gave us an opportunity to go out there and throw 70 or 75 pitches this weekend. And then when the dust settled, we had to make a decision on what we thought the best roadmap to three good games was. It seemed like that was the place to land this weekend and then we have to go play and see how this looks um, from a competitive setting with somebody else in this dugout do you think you'll allow yourself whether it's exchanging lineups at home plate or the national anthem to like take it in that here it is opening day i'm a head coach at florida state university i think i will uh, the anthem might be that time uh, the focus and the emphasis on on trying to play good baseball i, I that's on the big front burner, way back in the back, and it may not even, it may not even happen for me to be honest. Like I've I've been through a lot, you know, to get to today, and I think tomorrow you're just so focused and concerned with trying to get them out and see them play well, and then knowing you've got a lot of buttons to push 
to try to position them to win a, an opening day game. So I, I think that focus probably overrides everything else. If it happens, I think it's during the anthem when you're standing out there on the line. I'm sure there were a million texts when you got the job that have been a lot just leading up to this day. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. And I, I try to respond. And I think some people that have been around it realize this is a time to kind of <laughs> leave me try to do my thing. Um, but I, I can't tell you how many people have reached out and called and text and you know, that's probably going to continue. But the support of the program and the support for, for myself has been beyond anything I, I could have imagined. The decision to put Jamie on the weekend, how much of that is just his mentality seems to just always stay flatline and, and never really be phased by the competition? Yeah, Brett helps a lot. You know, steady Eddie pitches off the fastball. And clearly, you know, some of the young guys have only started games. Like you have a high school pitcher that's coming in here as a freshman, he hasn't thrown in relief and they haven't played nine inning games. They played seven inning games and most of your high school arms, they get the ball once a week and they throw seven innings and they go home. And that, so sometimes for a, a young guy to be in that role might be an easier transition out of the gate than you're at, if you're asking somebody to experience warming up in the bullpen and, and trying to navigate, you know, coming into a game with runners on base and the traffic and the things that go into a, a leverage situation. So and he has been very consistent. You know, his stuff has clearly been effective and we thought that was the smoothest transition into a college career and, and entering a season for us as a staff. I think you said that you saw somebody else with base paths like this and the, the, just the, the turf. Um, and are, you, are you constantly looking at what other people do, whether it's coaching or whether it's facilities, to look for better, better ways to do Yes, it? yes. And have you always been that way, I guess? Yeah, I have. And Mississippi State might have been the first group to do this with the, the home plate turf. And I talked to Lamonis about it. My son's a GA at Mississippi State, and we talk about it. And John Cohen was their AD. I talked to him about it. And it removes maintenance from one of the most difficult places to maintain. And you can walk out and do anything you want to do in this area, and it's ready to go. And the turf, as it's evolved in the last 10 years, when you walk into that batter's box, that turf is so firm and dense that if you were blindfolded, you probably don't know that you're on, on turf. You feel like you're in like a good hard dirt surface. So when you look at all that, it's a pretty easy decision. And this surface stays cooler, so when it gets hot, the product in this turf will not heat up even like your infield clay. So you have that. And when people come to visit, when you walk in here, as opposed to having the tarp and the sandbags and all the stuff trying to cover home plate and the dirt baselines, you have a tarp covering the mound and the rest of the field looks essentially game ready. So I think it presents itself better. That would be the last reason to do it, but it still is in play as much as the recruiting factors in. Two, two of Jamie's starters didn't really throw it all last year. Burke just had two starts before he got injured and Williams didn't throw it all. Just when they have two kind of mysteries on the weekend rotation, what does the preparation process look like for you? Well, we know the lefty tomorrow has got a really good change up. Now this, this could evolve. I mean, we're talking about a guy that was injured and we're, we're going way back, but you would think some of the profiles are still the same and he's competitive. I think he pitched here last year and then had another really, really good outing tough. So um, we're trying to match up everything that we know to do in our last couple practices to what we feel like we're going to see and we'll game plan the same way. And then tomorrow in our scouting report meeting, we'll go over what we know and what we think we know on opening day. They need to understand this, the players. This is data that's a little older. Like you're not going to have scouting report information on their preseason. So we're going back. It's a little dated, but Rich and Chuck and Brad do a phenomenal job of digging, digging into their information. The same thing goes with our defensive positioning and um, some of the other base running stuff that they're going to do that we're trying to prepare for and that they're obviously trying to hone in on from what my team has done in the past and what the returning personnel here is able to do. You have a, such an established staff, guys you've worked with before, um, so everybody's got roles. The things you do at practice, like the things that you are hands on with, are those things that just that you're filling the gaps, or are those the things that you want to be? Those are probably the things we won't be real good at. <laughs> but, no, I, you know, I like 
the discussion with the infielders and work with the infielders and then you know trying to oversee what goes on and get to know the guys especially when you're new like you're evaluating balls off the bat for the outfielders and who's playing balls well in positions and you know some of the offensive stuff that we honed in on in the fall like the messaging and why we're doing what we're doing when they go to the cage then they get shoot 30 35 swings in the cage off the machines that's the work we're doing like I try to present that and message that out of the gate and now clearly as we've evolved like our guys are out there getting going right now like they know what I'm trying to do but there's still things I feel like I need to handle coaching wise like at practice and then in game uh, rich position the defense I help especially with the third base and with all the bunt stuff I help there and Chuck Chuck calls the pitches and as he's calling the pitches I feel like it's my responsibility to help maybe stay ahead of the big picture lineup situation and where they are in the order and help communicate to Seth in the bullpen. So we're ahead of any pitching matchups that may be lurking as these innings evolve because your pitching coach is, he's really playing the game when he's calling the game. And I don't want his detention, his attention diverted to what's going on in the bullpen while he's trying to construct pitch sequencing for, for the game stuff. Yeah, the last one. Have you coached first, and third, in the first or third in the past? I've coached third a good bit, but the way we do our offense, like I, as a head coach, I haven't done it. I feel like managing the dugout and the way we do our offensive stuff and communicating with Chuck about what pitching changes we may be looking to make when we flip back to our defensive side, I, that has worked better for me than trying to coach third. And to be honest, Rich is phenomenal at what he does at third base, and that's had good rhythm for us. All right, guys.